Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Craig Kiger, Minnesota DNR Shooting Sports uh, Education Specialist. And I'm here today with a very good friend, Lindsay Chartel. I've had the honor of hunting with her and uh, helping with some training one day. Um, so Lindsay, why don't you tell the folks a little about yourself? All right. So a little about me, I am, my position with the DNR is the forest habitat research scientist, which is part of our wildlife research unit in the Division of Fish and Wildlife. I'm based in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, up here in the North Woods. And I have worked here for the DNR for nearly nine years now. Uh, I started hunting as an adult in 2014 after seeing many of my DNR colleagues enjoying the sport. And my current pack of dogs includes Murray, who is an eight year old Labradoodle. And I had Murray before I started hunting. For not coming from hunting lines, he does a great job flushing birds and he loves to come along in the woods. I also have Cooper. He's a three-year-old German short-haired pointer. He's a powerhouse in the woods and he just lives for bird hunting. He loves it. And then I recently added Durden, who is now a six-month-old German short-haired pointer puppy. And he's already showing his skills pointing birds and having birds shot over him already this fall. All right, so I will jump into the talk now. Uh, Minnesota is really unique and we are blessed that we have such a huge diversity of game birds to chase. This stems from our diverse vegetation conditions across the state, from forests in the north to prairies in the south. We also have agricultural lands, brushlands, wetlands, lakes, and rivers. Today, I am going to focus on upland game birds. Uh, this is a term given to the non waterfowl game birds. They're often hunted on the wing and with dogs. In Minnesota, they're considered small game. Uh, some examples I have here are a few of my favorites the woodcock, uh, the rough grouse, the sharp tailed grouse, and the pheasant. In Minnesota, the license requirements to hunt these birds is a small game license. You also need a free HIP certification, which is the Hunter Information Program for woodcock or snipe, which are migratory, and a pheasant stamp if you want to chase pheasants. A blaze orange or pink is required, either the hat or shirt vest, except during firearm and muzzleloader deer seasons when you need both a hat and a shirt or vest. The seasons and limits in Minnesota vary by species, so be sure to check the regulations to make sure you're following the season dates and daily and possession limits. Currently, we have rough grouse, spruce grouse, sharp-tailed grouse in the northwest, uh, gray or Hungarian partridge, woodcock snipe, and dove seasons open. Pheasant season will be opening on October 16th, and in Minnesota, prairie chickens can only be hunted by residents with a special permit drawn in a lottery. Uh, shooting hours are typically a half an hour before sunset to before sunrise to sunset. However, pheasant shooting hours are 9 a.m. to sunset. So for today, I'm going to talk to you about hunting with dogs. Uh, I'll touch on some of the training and gear needed to get in the woods, and then we'll also get into some tips for you on bird habitat to get your dog into birds and where to go to hunt, because those are some of the most common questions that both new and old hunters have. But to start off, humans and dogs have a long history of hunting together. Evidence of hunting dogs goes back 20,000 years and is found throughout time. It's thought that dogs were the first animal that was domesticated by humans before cows, sheep, or even horses.
So pointing, pointing is the instinct to pause upon scenting game. Dog breeding over time has selected for a longer and a stronger point. Many pointing breeds now exist. I just have a few shown here, the English setter, the German wire-haired pointer, and the German short-haired pointer. But there are tons of different pointing breeds, uh, some very common and some more rare, but there's almost too many to go over them all. So pointing dogs are really beneficial for bird hunting because they can range further and cover more ground searching for game than say a flushing dog. And they provide the shooter time to get ready and in position for a shot while they're on point. Now choosing a pointing breed can be really overwhelming given all the breeds that are out there and each breed has its own style. Some of the things to consider are the size of the dog and its coat type, uh, their temperament and your family situation, uh, range and speed, how far they're gonna move out away from you in the woods, heat or cold tolerance, and retrieving ability. A lot of these things have to do with what type of birds you wanna hunt and the cover that you wanna hunt in. In the thick grouse woods, a closer working dog can be a benefit, whereas out in the open prairie, a far ranging fast dog can cover a lot of ground. Uh, short haired dogs are better suited for warm conditions, whereas a longer haired dog would be better under cold conditions. Most importantly, you should talk to different breeders and make sure that if you want a hunting dog, you should choose a dog from proven hunting lines that is hunted in the same style, in the same habitats that you want to hunt. To hunt a dog, there are really just two minimum requirements, as far as I, I'm concerned, for basic training. Number one, your dog has to have a good reliable recall to a hear or come command in all situations. This includes being able to stop your dog from chasing a deer or running into a road. And this is really important just for safety in the woods. The second thing that you always need is a proper gun introduction. There are many ways to accomplish this. There's a ton of information out there, but the best way in the way that I like to use is to start with a quieter gun, like a blank in a starter pistol. Uh, I use a 209 primer and introduce the gun with birds while shooting at a distance. Associating shooting with the excitement of a bird makes a really easy introduction for the dog. So they're excited about the bird and they're ignoring the gunshot. Uh, slowly move in closer to the dog and use louder shotguns until you're shooting over your dog. And if as long as they're showing no sign of uh, timidness or fear of the shot, then you know you're ready to hit the woods for hunting season. Now, after those two things, there's a lot of obedience and commands that you can teach your dog, but the most important part is really exposure. The best way to train a hunting dog is to just let them get out there and experience everything that comes along with hunting. Instincts are very powerful. If you have a hunting dog from a good breeding lines, they can pick up pointing and finding game naturally. The first year should really be all about getting out in the woods, getting in cover, finding birds, and very little pressure on the dog especially when they're under a year old and, and quite young. On top of that, another important component is building a strong bond between you and your dog so that you can hunt as a team. Uh, your dog should want to hunt with you, not by themselves, and they should be able to keep track of you in the woods. Those are kind of, I mean, this is what you need to get out in the woods and get started. There's a ton of other stuff that comes along with basic training with dogs, and there's a ton of information out there, so a lot to cover. Uh, it's often said that wild birds make wild bird dogs. 
And without wild birds, the dog doesn't learn how to hunt. So training on wild birds during early spring, late summer, and winter when the hunting seasons are closed is allowed in Minnesota. However, you may not train your dog on wild birds from April 16th to July 14th. This is called the quiet season by a lot of people. It protects nesting and young birds from disturbance. Um, late March and early April can be a really great time to run a pointing dog because we have large groups of woodcock that are migrating through from the north. And woodcock are known to hold really tight, which means they're going to sit still and let a dog get pretty close where they can smell them and point them. And you can get a lot of bird contacts with a young dog if you get into a big group of woodcock. Late summer is also a great time for training on wild birds. It's also a really good way to scout before the season starts. Uh, rough grouse are often in broods at that time and they're a little less jumpy, having probably not seen many humans. So it's a good chance to get out and get your dog on some birds. While training a dog in the field, you are allowed to carry a firearm or start a gun, but only with blank shells when the seasons are closed. Because wild birds aren't always that easy to find, a lot of people train their dogs with pen raised birds, and this is a really effective way to go about it. Pigeons, chucker, and quail are the birds of choice. Uh, feral pigeons are unprotected in Minnesota, so you can trap them to use for dog training. You can often get them the home back to a loft or a Johnny house to use multiple times if you don't shoot them. And you can also buy homer pigeons uh, specifically that will over time home back to your location and that's a really great way to get your dog on a lot of birds if you don't want to raise your own birds there are tons of resources out there for dog training um, look for things like local kennels hunting preserves uh, navda which is the north american versatile hunting dog association and akc hunt clubs they, there are a lot of different groups that you can join with a young puppy, get your dog on birds, work with other trainers, and, and learn how to train your dog for hunting. There's also just a ton of training lessons and tips online. It's ov almost overwhelming, and trying to find the right method can be tricky with so many different schools of thought out there on how to train a dog. So like I said, that first year for your dog should be all about exposure, finding birds and having fun. Uh, and that more advanced training can come later after the first hunting season. Some of the things that we usually train later are steadiness, which is teaching the dog to stay on point until released. And the release can be just the flushing of a bird, the shot of a gun or a command like fetch or go on whatever your preference is for how steady you want your dog. Dogs are often taught the woe command at, as well at this time, which means to stop and stand still. So no matter what they're doing, when you say woe, they stop. Uh, retrieving is another skill that can either come naturally depending on the breeding or it may need to be trained. This includes locating down game and bringing shot game to hand. Some of the common commands that are taught to train retrieving include fetch, uh, dead bird, hunt dead, or the hold command. When hunting multiple dogs together, backing, which is also called honoring, can be taught. Uh, this is when a dog points at the sight of another dog. Like in this photo, we've got Cooper, my German short hair on point in the trees, and B, the English setter, backing him. Some dogs are natural backers. They just see it and they take the cue from the other dog and they don't even need any training. But others, it needs to be trained. And you can do that using pen raised birds or even in wild bird situations by using that woe command to stop your dog when they're within the view of another dog on point.
All right, so some tips for hunting with your dog. It doesn't have to be hard. If you're a new hunter with a dog, just get out there and start out easy. Just walk trails, letting your dog work the woods on either side searching for birds. Pay attention to where your dog is and their behavior. Often a wagging tail or a nose to the ground tracking can alert you that your dog is getting birdie and is about to find something. Try to approach points by circling around the dog and coming in head on. This can be especially effective with rough grouse who like to run and they don't hold as tight as woodcock. Most importantly, just trust the dog. Their instincts will lead them to the birds and they're usually right. I don't know how many times I've had a dog on point and thought it was nothing than to have a bird flush right off of the end of their nose. So always trust the dog. There's a few safety aspects I wanted to touch on for you to remember when hunting with the dog. Um, always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction away from the dogs, typically up. Unload your gun when crossing obstacles or setting it on the ground or attending to the dog. Dogs always seem to step on or knock over your gun when you're not holding it. And only take the safety off when you're ready to shoot. Always be aware of where the dog is before shooting and avoid shooting birds on the ground or low flushes because dogs can suddenly lunge or jump at flushing birds. Uh, finally, as just a matter of etiquette, don't command other people's dogs unless you're given permission. There's also a number of hazards in the woods to be prepared for when hunting with dogs. Injuries are very common. Scratches, strained muscles, it, it seems to happen all the time. Porcupines and skunks are common encounters in the woods. Uh, aversion training, particularly with porcupines, can be done to teach your dog to avoid them by using a dead porcupine and a, an e-collar to teach them to avoid porcupines, but some dogs are just more prone to tangle with them than others. So it's always good to have some tools for that in the vest. In more open landscapes, barbed wire fences can be a big issue and cause serious injuries. It's good to introduce your dog to wire fences early, especially if you live in an area without them, like Northwoods because when you head out to the prairie, then they'll, they'll have seen fences before and know how to get through them safely. Ticks are also really abundant in Minnesota. I've been pulling some little deer ticks off my dogs all week, and so you should have your dogs on preventative medications. I love to use the chewables, the monthly chewables, and it's, they work really well. Weather can also be a risk, heat and cold. Lately, it's been heat that's been the big problem, especially in those evenings after work. It's still been pretty warm up here. And a lot of that can be alleviated by conditioning your dog, by running them during warm weather, cold weather, everything like that. A lack of conditioning over the off season can also be a risk that you can avoid it can lead to injuries and fatigue when the season opens and you throw your dog out there. You should also be cautious of traps and snares, particularly bobcat conibear traps. The bobcat season in Minnesota starts December 18th, so there's not a lot of overlap, but it's something to be cautious of. Uh, you can learn how to operate traps and snares. There's a lot of great information online and you can carry leashes or zip ties that will help you open a trap if need be, as well as uh, wire cutters for snares. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was just other hunters. Uh, many bird hunters prefer to stay out of the woods during firearm deer season, especially hunters with dogs, but there are a lot of other hunter, hunting seasons that overlap with, with bird season, such as bear hunting. And if you're in an area where you're concerned, a blaze orange vest or a bell for your dog will help other hunters identify your dog and, and avoid any accidents.
some of the gear that you should always bring along when hunting with the dog is having them wear a collar with your contact information. Uh, a leash, water for both you and your dog, and I'll admit I share the same water bottles with my dogs. A first aid kit. Some of the items for dog injuries that are really helpful to have in that first aid kit are a Leatherman or other kind of tool for pulling quills and eye wash because it seems like dogs are always getting scratched in the eye or seeds in the eye. And it's good to wash those out. Um, an e-collar or a whistle it can help with training and recall. And then having a good crate for transport just keeps your dog safe and out of the way. When you hunt with a pointing dog, you also need a way to find your dog on point. Traditionally, bells were used and they're still very common today. It's an inexpensive way to keep track of your dog. You can hear where they are while they're running and when that bell goes silent, you know that they're on point. But far running dogs and those who just can't keep track of where the dog is with the bell, there are other options out there, including electronic beeper collars that can beep both while your dog's running and then while your dog is stops moving. Uh, GPS tracking devices like and watches that you can sync your GPS to that will tell you when your dog goes on point and where exactly he is. Personally, I use a Garmin Alpha 100 paired with a Garmin Instinct watch and then either a bell for my little puppy because I like to hear what he's doing, if he's running hard, if he's slowed down tracking. And then I typically run quiet and use a beeper collar on point only with a hawk screech sound for my older short hair so that I can get to him on point as quickly as possible. Pointing dogs that are steady to flushing birds and their handlers can volunteer for wildlife research projects as well. Um, some examples are woodcock banding, which happens annually every spring. The dogs are used to locate the hen woodcock and her chicks, and then we put bands on the chicks. We've also used dogs in the DNR to help locate spruce grouse for trapping and radio collaring. So there's a ton of information out there on pointing dogs and I barely have scratched the surface so far, but I wanna touch on some tips to help you get your dog into birds because this is one of the biggest questions out there that everyone's always asking. And I'm gonna focus on forest habitats for, for now. And habitat is the shelter, water, food, and space required for a species to survive and reproduce. To find birds, you really just have to find their habitat. Uh, rough grouse habitat is early successional or young forests. Typically 10 to 25 year old aspen or birch is preferred. Uh, look for dense stands of broomstick to wrist size aspen. Uh, dense, even age trees commonly make up a lot of grouse covers. However, rough grouse can also use older forest conifers and lowland brush, and they do tend to like some diversity. A good diversity of covers in an area can lead to really great grouse hunting, as grouse are commonly found on the edges of different cover types. And when it's raining or snowing, I'll head to the conifers because that's where grouse are often hiding out to stay dry. In the transition zone in southeast part of the state, grouse are often using oak forests. And you can see uh, by this range map here, we've got rough grouse covering a good part of the state, uh, except for the prairie in the southwest. So rough grouse habitat is all about food. Grouse foods include aspen leaves, stems, buds, different catkins, insects, mushrooms, fruits. Red berries in the fall can be a really good sign of a good grouse spot. And if you wanna find out what your grouse has been eating, you can look in the crop. I've got some examples here of grouse crops. They can be quite full in the evening once they've been feeding all day. Uh, this photo here with the green leaves, that is some 
sweet Sicily that they were feeding on later in the fall. Whatever is still green out there, they might be eating. Clover is a really common one too, or even just cut aspen leaves. Uh, this next photo has some of these catkins from, don't know exactly what this one is, but you can find them on birch, aspen, hazel, different shrubs. And then lastly, I like to call this the grouse food pyramid. This is all from one single grouse. They've got the, the little catkins, the mushrooms, insects, aspen leaves, some berries, and some little seeds at the top. So it's really interesting to look in the grouse, see what they're eating, and then you can target those habitats. All right, American woodcock is another favorite bird of mine to chase. Their habitat is pretty similar to rough grouse, and they can often be found with rough grouse, offering a chance for a mixed species double. Uh, they prefer early successional forests and brushlands with typically five to 18 year old aspen, and they like those dense even age stands as well. But they also use and need forest openings, fields, and lowland brush. Woodcock like areas with moist soils and presence of earthworms. Woodcock feed by probing the soil with their bill. They feed on earthworms and other invertebrates. Probe holes are a good sign that woodcock are in the area, which is shown here. And woodcock splash, which is their poop, is another sign to look for. It's a large white spot with clumps of soil in it, like this one here. Now, spruce grouse is a commonly overlooked game species in the forest, as a lot of people think they taste piney and aren't worth shooting, but, and they can be an easy target. They're often referred to as the fool's hen, but they're still a uh, species that a lot of people like to chase. They're in the northernmost part of the state and can be found in conifer forests and evergreen brushlands. Uh, spruce fir, jack pine, and cedar are cover types to look for within the boreal forest. They like middle-aged forest with branches that reach the ground and they feed on conifer needles, thus the piney flavor. So one of the most common questions that I see out on social media is where should I go to hunt? And in Minnesota, we have more than 11 million acres of public land to hunt. It is a blessing, but can also be overwhelming. We've got state lands, county tax forfeit lands, federal lands, and timber industry lands. Up here in Grand Rapids, we've got a ton of land and land that it's under a conservation easement and is open to hunting. So where do you start? A few places that are perfect for new hunters are hunter walking trails, wildlife management areas, rough grouse management areas, and the DNR Recreation Compass. Hunter walking trails are an easy way to access wildlife habitat that's specifically managed for game birds, and they all allow dogs. They have established trailheads with good off-road parking for any type of vehicle, and they're often gated so to prevent motorized access so you don't have to worry about your dog encountering traffic or ATVs. Uh, they're also mowed so it's easy walking. You can let the dog get into the thick stuff and maybe get an open shot across that trail. And there's just a wealth of information on our website. There's info and maps. The maps even show habitat types to guide you to the right covers. Uh, Here's a trail just outside of Grand Rapids, and it's got the young forest labeled down in the south end. Wildlife management areas are another great place to hunt. These are state lands managed for wildlife habitat. Most of them are open to hunting, aside from a few sanctuaries, and they usually have some hunter walking trails. Uh, the DNR website lists the cover types and the game species present, so you can key in on locations to hunt. They're found throughout the state covering forests, grasslands, and wetlands. So you can hunt just about any species somewhere on a WMA. And there's 
Again, a lot of info and some really great maps on the website. You can download map data to your cell phone or your GPS unit as well. And then the last spot I'll mention uh, is our rough grouse management areas. These are forests and lands that are managed for rough grouse and woodcock. They use a small block forest management technique to provide lots of different age classes in a really diverse mosaic. Uh, they've also got trailheads with really nice parking areas, maps online to guide you, and they all allow dogs. There are over 100,000 acres at 49 locations and 184 miles of hunter walking trails in these RGMAs alone. I go to them myself. They're just a nice place to take a dog out on a walk and get into some birds and you know you're going to be in the right habitat. So check out the website. We've got a map on there where you can find our GMAs close to you or up north, wherever you want to head in the state. There are a ton of other resources out there for mapping and scouting hunting spots from home. Uh, Google Maps, Google Earth, and many other apps are great places to view aerial imagery. Onyx is a popular app that shows land ownership data, as well as your location while you're in the field. Forest inventory data on state lands is available online for you to download, and you can use it in a variety of different mapping applications. And this can tell you the cover type and the age of the forest. Uh, for grouse and woodcock, I'm usually looking for recent harvests with young, dense trees. Uh, in this photo here, you can see the brighter green at the top. That is a young stand that's six years old. So it's just getting into a prime age for grouse and woodcock. It's got a wetland bordering it on the north. So in a dry year like this, a perfect place to hit for some grouse and woodcock that are looking for moister soils. And then this stand to the south here, is a little bit older but still a young forest it's 11 years old and it has a nice trail running through it a perfect place to start walking looking for birds so um honestly i could go on forever talking about hunting dogs and bird habitat but I wanted to kind of limit this because there's so many nuances to training in, in different breeds and things like that. But I just have some final thoughts for you. Um, bird dogs can become a lifelong passion and obsession if you let them. I know that has been the case for me over the past seven or so years since I started hunting, just gotten deeper and deeper into it. Uh, spending time in the outdoors with your canine best friends is rewarding no matter if your game bag is empty or full, doesn't matter how successful we are, it's always great to get out there. My dogs are a huge motivator for me to get outside and their joy just rubs off on me so easily. Uh, you know, in the end, it's really all about the dogs for me, seeing them work and hit the field is the best part of being out there. So thank you for listening. Uh, feel free to reach out to me after this talk. My email address is, is listed here. You can also find me out there on social media, chasing after dogs and posting photos of our adventures. But we've got plenty of time now, and I'd really love to hear and answer some specific questions from you guys, if you have any. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Craig to help facilitate that. Okay, we've got a couple of questions in. Um, I know that you do a lot of training with a uh, hunting club um, and I believe Cooper has actually uh, got some awards for his abilities. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do quite a bit of my training with um, with NAVDA. And we've got a, a bit of a spinoff club that we just started up here in the Reamer area at Pine Ridge Grouse Camp, where we had a weekly training night. Anyone welcome to come check it out. Uh, focused on NAVDA members and 
NAVDA does a natural ability test for young dogs, and so Cooper did get a prize one in his NA test. He's still a, a young dog. He hasn't done any of the more advanced tests yet, but you know, he's also run AKC hunt tests, which we've got a lot of great AKC clubs around the area. We're members of the Ball Bluff Pointing Dog Club, which is out of Jacobson, Minnesota. And we train there once a month or so. We have a training group and he's got his junior hunter title as well. And so we'll be working on that with the little puppy this next summer. Cool. Um... I, I noticed in the chat that James has put up a lot of links and we had a question from, from Linda about, could you please uh, post those addresses, web addresses to the hunting trails again? So Linda, check those out. Uh, our first question we're gonna take today is from Nathan and he wants to know if the bells spook the birds at all. You know, that's something a lot of people debate about and i've shot many birds over a dog with a bell on i've also shot many birds over dogs with beepers with the beeping sound or i i like the hawk screech sound because it's more natural and i don't like to listen to a bell the whole time but some people love that bell that's part of the experience is hearing that bell tinkle in the woods and stop yep. so i don't think bells spook birds Everyone has a different style, but I kind of like the stealthy quiet mode myself with that pointing indication. Okay, our next question comes from Larry and um, he wants to know any comments about pheasant hunting with pointing dogs. And this yeah, is what I, I got to do with you. Yes, we, we did do some pheasant hunting and pointing dogs are great with pheasants as well. I've done some, pheasant hunting in Minnesota and other states with my pointing dogs and and they're pretty good at it. Pheasants are a little tougher to point because they love to run and dig and in, get into those cattails and squirrel around and so a lot of people prefer flushing dogs with pheasants but there's no reason yeah pointing dogs are great pheasant hunters and they really I've really noticed with my German short hair Cooper that he just takes on a different kind of style of hunting, whether he's in the woods chasing grouse, but when he gets in that open field with pheasants, he starts doing a lot more tracking. He's moving a lot more because those birds are moving a lot. So they really pick up on that and they learn how to hunt different birds. Okay. Um, our next question is from Amber and I know you talked about it in your presentation a little bit, but could you give us a quick overview on how to work with your dog to help overcome the gunshot? Yeah, um, so, I mean, for a dog that's just starting out and has never heard gunshots, just doing it right from the beginning with the excitement of birds is really helpful. But if you've got a dog that's already a little bit timid or nervous around gunshots, uh, starting at a really far distance, like having a shooter 100 yards away while your dog is getting really excited about a bird or if they don't care about birds, really excited about food or whatever it is they like, tennis balls, something that is going to draw their attention away from that shot and have that shot 100 yards away where they're barely hearing it. And then slowly over multiple sessions, don't do it all in one day, but over a month or every couple of days start moving closer to the dog and if they show any sign of like noticing that shot then just move further away keep the excitement up with whatever it is you've got birds and slowly move closer to where they're they're getting used to it and not showing any aversion to it at all good so our next question comes from jason any tips to get my 13 month old Visla to retrieve? She points great and goes to the bird when down, but she doesn't like to pick it up. Yeah, that's a great question. And I've, I've been working on that with my short hair as well. Some dogs just are natural retrievers and others are not, but um, I mean, practicing retrieving with other toys that they do like to pick up and maybe adding a wing or getting used to those feathers in the mouth. I mean, every dog is a different reason. Some of them just don't want those feathers in their mouth. They don't like that. But others, 
who knows they just don't want to hold anything so it depends on the dog the real answer but um you know force fetch is what most people would say I mean, you can do a trained retrieve which is that what i do with uh, positive reinforcement with treats teaching your dog to hold to hold something in its mouth starting with maybe a bumper moving to a frozen bird and then to a warm live bird slowly gradually building up to what you want working on that hold and then walking away from them and calling them to you to where they bring the item to you and just conditioning that response that when you when they go to something and you tell them to fetch or hold or retrieve that they bring it back to you uh, slowly building it up from some other type of item to, to that bird is what i would do good uh, our next question is from Jim. Can you talk about how you approach early, mid, and late season tactics? What, if anything, do you do differently? That's a great question. So early in the season, for me, it's about the leaves and visibility. And so I do a lot of trail walking kind of edge walking openings, looking for places where we're going to be able to get a shot off maybe not getting into those super dense covers early season just because there's not a lot of shooting opportunities with all the leaves so something that's a little more open um, as far as what the birds are doing they tend to be grouped up still really early the rough grouse are and woodcock it's a lot of local birds so you're not going to run into a ton of them um, i just kind of get out and try to get somewhere where i can get a shot because the dogs are usually finding the birds. Mid-season, I'm hitting all those dense covers where the leaves are now down so I can see what's happening and get some shots off. Birds are usually in there. There's going to be some berries around still. There's going to be little patches of green food here and there. So if you can find one of those food sources, a bunch of mushrooms, then that's a great place to go to and hit. And then when it comes to late season, you know, last year we didn't have a ton of snow and I hunted straight through to January 3rd and that late season, I'm looking for more conifers, especially when there's snow and it's cold. I'm looking for more of a mixed forest for rough grouse, uh, a little bit older, maybe getting into the 20 early 20 year old stands with a bit of conifer mixed in them seems like the grouse start to come together again at that end of the year so you might walk for a while and not see anything and then run into a big group of grouse that are snow roosting together in the conifers together but i've had some really good luck with a little bit more of a diverse habitat later in the season for rough grouse uh, when it comes to woodcock when that migration comes through and we're already starting to see some big numbers of birds here and there um, they can be just about anywhere, but a lot of that really young, maybe four to six year old aspen, they seem to pile up in that kind of stuff. If you can find somewhere with good moist soil. So when you're walking, it feels like the soil's kind of mushing beneath your foot so they can get in there and probe for food. Very good. Uh, Brian's got a question here. What would you recommend for resources for identifying plants, et cetera, that grouse are eating and using? Yeah, that is a great question. And I don't know if I have a good source to really look. I mean, I love, I just search on the internet for everything. You can find just about anything on there, but, um, I have a couple of little books uh, for trees and shrub identification that are nice. I can't really recommend anything specific at this time, but um, some of those apps out there, like the plant snap or take a picture of a leaf and it'll tell you what it is. They actually work really well. And I've used those quite often to identify plants that I, that I'm not sure of. So, Sorry, I don't have anything specific for you, Brian, but but uh, there's just a ton of stuff out there. So Joshua is looking for some help in uh, reining in his rangy two-year-old short hair. Yeah, so I've got a short hair myself that likes to get out there and run, but 
you know, it's tough during the hunting season because you want to be out there hunting. Uh, one of the things you can do during the off season, if you're training with, say, pen raised birds, is to put those birds close into where you start so that that dog's finding birds when he's just starting running and he's really close to you or take a walk and have the birds on you so that they're thinking that the birds are always with you. They're not out there further away from you. When you're in the field, um, it's tough when you're out hunting. Uh, you can call your dog in more often, but I don't like to do that a lot. But just, you know, trying to be engaged in what they're doing more, uh, changing direction often so that they have to change direction to stay with you or to find you can keep them kind of in closer because they're paying a little more attention to you and not just running out expecting you, you're going to walk in a straight line following them. So kind of mixing up your your directions so that they can't get too far out ahead is a, is a good idea as well. But it can be tough. They can be hard headed and and it's hard to to break that once once they've got their range established. We had a comment from one of our viewers that said the uh, iNaturalist is a great resource, and I see James has added that link up in the chat, so you can check yeah, that out. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I'll have to check that out too. Always um, have a good plant ID resource. Josh uh, wants to know about the wool command. Can you walk through when to use it, use wool, and do you only need to use it when your dog will not hold on point? Yeah, so the wool command, I teach it right from the beginning, and it's not always, it's not associated with birds when I start. It's just when I say whoa, you stop. So we're just walking, say whoa, that means you stop, you stay there. Uh, with my puppy, I started putting him on woe, and then I would walk away or walk around him, and he'd have to stand there. And then when I say, all right, he can move. So that's how I start training it. And then when we transition to birds, with my puppy, when he goes on point, I will say woe once just to reinforce that I want him to stay there and not pounce in on the bird, which is what their natural instinct would be. And that has uh, transitioned well into the woods so far this year. But if he moves, then I would say, whoa, again. With my older dog who knows he has to stay on point, I won't say, whoa, at all, unless he moves and I need to tell him to, whoa, again. But you want to be able to use that, whoa, command anytime. Say there's a deer that jumps up or an ATB is driving by and you want to stop your dog. You don't want them running back to you necessarily because they could get in the way of traffic or something. You just want them to stop. So having them be able to whoa at any time is just a really great safety command as well. And then if they do whoa on command without birds, you can also teach that backing. So that when they're coming in close to a dog on point, you can woe them. Or if another dog is on point and we've got hunters walking over there, you can woe your dog over here to keep them out of the situation. Okay. Um, Jim wants to know if you ever had any issues with predators when you're out there hunting. So I have never run into a situation where I've seen wolves or been confronted by wolves, but I see a lot of wolf sign, scat, things like that. I've had situations with friends dogs where they've kind of been like afraid to go down the trail, really sticky, staying by you. And you know, I'm not usually worried about it. I tend to make a lot of noise, mostly yelling at my dogs, but then we've got the beeper and and so I think making a lot of noise in the woods is good for wolves and bears and whatever else is out there just to let them know you're in the area and not surprise them. But, you know, if I start seeing a lot of wolf sign, fresh sign, tracks, scat, if I have a dog that's getting sticky and like afraid, you know, there's a million places to hunt. I'll just go somewhere else and, and try to avoid getting into that situation. So 
So I'm not overly concerned with it, but you know, things happen and it's always good to be prepared, know where your dog is. That's why I love having that GPS on my collar, dog's collar, because I know where he is all the time and I can find him. Good. Um, Josh asked a question. How do you know if your dog is breaking point or following the bird that's moving? Yeah, so everyone kind of has a different training style. Some people want their dog to stay there until they get there and release their dog. Other people want their dog to move and track on their own. My dogs tend to, to move and track on their own when they know a bird's moving. But I mean, you're gonna know if they're breaking because the bird is gonna flush. And that's what you don't want is the dog flushing the bird. But if they start moving ahead really slowly, like nose to the ground, tracking, and they go on point again, I mean, it's pretty obvious there. <coughs> Sorry, that they're tracking a, a moving bird, but eventually they might bump that bird up. And I mean, it's all about looking at, trying to see the intent of your dog. And it's kind of hard in the woods when you can't always see your dog, but. That's why training out in an open field, you kind of, you learn your dog, you know your dog and you know what they're doing. So you can kind of tell if they're being a jerk or if, if they're on a track. <laughs> uh, James had made a note here that we had some questions in the chat, James. I don't see those. So if you could read those for me. Yeah, absolutely. First, um, thanks so much, Lindsay and, and Craig for the for the conversation. It's been really it's been a really great uh, talk. Um, yeah, we did have some comments put in the chat that um, came to me directly uh, that, that didn't go to the Q&A. So first off, um, you know, Julia pointed out that, you know, NAVDA, the, the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association is such a great um, community for training support. So if you're new to this sort of thing, um, having that, you know, having that group of folks that are out there that all they want is for more people to be doing this stuff. So they're, you know, they're, they're really giving of their time and their expertise and it's a tremendous community to plug into if you haven't done so already. So that's a tremendous resource and um, you can just look them up um, in a V H D a NAVDA. Yeah. Minnesota is um, actually the largest chapter in the country. So we've got a, a great resource there to take advantage of in their training days. I mean, everyone's out hunting now, but in the spring we'll be started up again with, with training. That's awesome. And then, yeah, I did make sure to put, um, there's links in the chat for our, uh, for our WMAs, our rough grouse management areas, um, as well as our recreation compass and the hunter walking trails. So if you're looking for more of that information, check the chat, it's in there. Um, there was a question. It said, uh, "It seems that dogs on point have a different tail than show dogs. Is that? Could you speak just briefly about that? Like, what does that? What, what does that look like? What does that mean? Like, are are there differences between show dogs and field dogs, and 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 how they act when they're in the woods? Well, there's certainly differences between uh, hunting dogs and show dogs, just based on the breeding over time, but. You know, even in the woods, every dog kind of has a different tail set. Some of them have that 12 o'clock straight up poker tail. Others have kind of a straight out, I guess it would be a three o'clock tail. <laughs> and some have a straight tail, some have a sickle tail. You know, every dog is going to be different. And if you have a style that you like, you know, look at those parents, look at the, the breeding that you're getting into and try to find, you know, that style that you prefer. But there's a wide variety of hunting dog tail types and you know some dogs are flagging a lot which is wagging their tail and others are just not moving at all all depends on the breed and in the breeding Excellent. you get to know the your dog's birdiness you know after a few uh hunts that they're acting different they're excited about whatever they're taking in for a smell uh lindsay thank you so much it's been a fast almost hour here now uh, and I want to thank the audience for great questions today you guys came up with some really good stuff and uh, we're going to continue the bird hunting theme next week James we're doing pheasant hunting yep I'll be uh, I'll be talking pheasant hunting with um, with a, a, a partner with the backcountry hunters and anglers Matt Lee 
uh, we're going to be talking about getting on some getting on some roosters. Cool, cool. So again, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we're going to go back to the green room, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much. Yes, thank thanks you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Lindsay.